Welcome back to the series that I'm calling a little bit tongue-in-cheek, Sciencing. It's intended to help you to better understand scientific research. Better understand and better interpret. In this module, we're going to look at the Bradford Hill Criteria, a set of criteria that can be applied to observational research to get a sense of the likelihood of a correlation actually indicating a causal relationship. Now, if you haven't watched the modules related to observational study designs, I do suggest you do that before continuing. However, to recap, correlation does not mean causation. Just because A and B go up together, it does not mean that A is causing B to go up or that B is causing A to go up. And if A goes down as B goes up, it does not necessarily mean that A causes B to go down or B causes A to go up. But when we see this kind of relationship, we call it an inverse correlation. So if you see inverse relationship, inverse correlation written anywhere, it's suggesting that as well, or it's showing that as one thing went up, another thing went down. Not necessarily because they're causally related, but that's just what happened. What we would need to do, what we should do whenever possible, when we make this kind of observation, this correlational observation and observational research is come up with an experiment to test it. Sometimes though, that may not be feasible. It may not be feasible on ethical grounds. It may not be feasible with the time available. It may not be feasible because the financial resources aren't available. It may be a combination of those things. In that instance, we might be forced to rely at least partially on observational research to try to get a sense of how likely it is that any observed association reflects causality, meaning that A indeed does influence or cause B, or B indeed does influence or at the extreme cause A. In 1965, English statistician and epidemiologist Sir Austin Bradford Hill, who you can see here, came up with a useful set of criteria we can apply when we're in the scenario. Now these cannot prove causality, they can only give us an insight into its likelihood. So the first criteria is strength or effect size. And in Sir Bradford Hill's own words, the larger the association, the more likely that it is causal. Now a small association doesn't mean there is no causal link, but a larger effect makes a causal link more likely. So if we take something like risk, so risk of what we now know is asbestosis, so that kind of gives the game away, but let's say we didn't know that yet, uh, we just had a lung disease with a certain characteristics, the risk of that and the exposure to asbestos increases that lung condition by five or tenfold in people who get the, con uh, in people who have been exposed versus people who haven't been exposed, then, well, we would say that makes it more likely that the association is causal versus, let's say, we only found an increase of 20% risk. So in one case, we're dealing with 500 to 1,000% increase, a 5 to 10-fold increase. In the other example, we are dealing with, say, a 20% increase. We're more likely to think, hmm, this may very well be causal if there is a much bigger increase associated with the given exposure. Criterion two is consistency or reproducibility. Consistent findings in different places or samples and using different study designs make a causal relationship more likely. So if the same association is observed repeatedly, we're intuitively inclined to assume a causal link. But we need to first check that other likely explanations can reasonably be rejected. So notice careful wording, reasonably be rejected. For example, is it always the same group of researchers or the same cohort of study participants that show a given association? In other words, might the association not only not be causal, might it even be the result of some flaw in how the research is done, uh, data is collected or analyzed, and therefore might it not exist at all? So we want, we want to assure ourselves this is not likely. Criterion three relates this to this a little bit. So here causation is more likely if there is a very specific population at a specific site with a specific disease with no other likely explanation. In other words, 
the more specific an association between a factor or an exposure and an effect or an outcome is, the bigger the probability of a causal relationship. One example would be when people in a specific profession are found to have much higher incidence of a specific medical condition relative to others living in, in the same area, and also when they have similar incidence of other medical conditions as those living in those areas. Only one specific medical condition is dramatically increased. The caution to this criterion is that exposure to, say, a chemical or a behavior can sometimes contribute to the development of more than one medical condition. So if we're trying to work out, oh, is this harmful? Well, we may find that in one person, the harm is expressed somewhat differently to another person, but they are both harmed. So different people may develop different conditions because of the same exposure. It's a little bit of a caveat. It's the kind of thing that really makes us think. Criterion four is temporality. The effect has to occur after the cause, and if there is an expected delay between the cause and the expected effect or outcome, then the effect or outcome must occur after that delay. In other words, if we suspect A causes B, then we would need to observe that a change in A before we see a change in B. We would need to see A change before we see B change. A clear sequence would also help us to determine the direction of any causality. Is A more likely to cause B, or B more likely to cause A? Or put another way, which of A and B represents the exposure, and which represents the outcome? And again, if those are new terms for you, you're not quite clear on those, uh, go to an earlier module on uh, longitudinal cohort studies. When we don't have information about what happened when or even in what order, so for example, we only have cross-sectional uh, data from cross-sectional studies, then we cannot even assess temporality. The fifth criteria is biological gradient, or what I will call dose response. Greater exposure should generally lead to greater incidence of the effect or the outcome. However, in some cases, the mere presence of a factor can trigger the effect or outcome. I'm used to thinking, as I said, in terms of dose response. For example, if a medication is believed to have a certain side effect, we would generally expect that this side effect is observed more frequently at higher doses and or is more severe at high doses. It could be a frequency thing or it could be a severity thing. Now, that's unless we're dealing with a threshold rather than a gradient, as in uh, it becomes a problem after a certain level. Before that, it's not a problem. And increasing much beyond that level is not going to make that much of a difference. And we'll, again, we'll look at that, those concepts uh, because they are quite involved in another module. So for this criteria, it's important to keep in mind that the relationship may be neither linear, right, as one goes up, the other goes up, or threshold, as you hit a certain point, there is a problem. For example, for alcohol and several, uh, for, and several outcomes in relation to alcohol, the relationship has frequently, at least in the past, been reported as J-shaped, suggesting, but only suggesting, that having some is better than having none, but having lots is a problem. Now, uh, not giving alcohol-related advice here, there is some research to indicate it is basically a toxin at, at every exposure, and what we're really seeing there is something other than alcohol consumption at play. Maybe people uh, in some countries who have alcohol are more sociable, more socially connected, and therefore have the benefits of that, as long as alcohol consumption isn't too high, for example. Um, but you do sometimes see these unusual relationships, J-shaped curves, U-shaped curves, where um, we want at least a little, but not too much, and not none. Another problematic scenario is where multiple exposures appear to work together to promote a disease even at very low levels. So um, let's say exposures to multiple heavy metals together at low concentrations are the problem. So it's not always this straightforward, but when we do see a nice dose response, whatever the shape of that relationship, whatever the, the mathematical relationship is, we clearly see an increase in either incidence, prevalence, severity, as a result of an increase in exposure, then we are more inclined to think this could be causal. Criterion six is plausibility. A plausible mechanism between cause and effect makes a causal relationship more likely. Not having a, 
a plausible mechanism currently by which A influences B does not rule out causation, but having such a link should give us greater confidence that a causal relationship exists. If we have an explanation for how smoking might lead to lung cancer, and we have maybe that data in animals, for example, we have experimental data. Slightly different scenario, but I'll get, and I'll get to that. But then we have biological plausibility. And again, that makes us more confident that we're dealing with a causal relationship. Number seven is coherence. Meaning, the likelihood of a causal relationship is greatest when findings from observational and experimental research agree. But, although a general rule of thumb is to first observe association and then test whether that association is causal by doing experimental work, this won't always get the right answer if we don't get the parameters of the experiment right. One example would be selenium deficiency, which is associated with a condition called Cash and Beck disease, but only in the presence of other risk factors. So if we made people selenium deficient in the absence of those other factors, we might think there was no causal link between selenium and Cash and Beck, as an example. So experimental research is potent and powerful, but we still need to get it right. Appropriate experimental evidence should arguably be the first criterion, but if we had a good experimental evidence, we wouldn't need to apply these criteria in the first place. What Sir Hill was referring to when he said occasionally it is possible to appeal to experimental evidence was likely to be experimental evidence that did not necessarily address a specific association, but nonetheless had some relevance. I think we've moved on in, in terms of research capacity, and while we cannot always do experimental research, when possible, we should, and certainly more than just occasionally, as in his quote. So I'm going to say, observational findings should be verified by well-conducted experimental research whenever possible. That said, the same caution applies here as applied for coherence. The experiment may not replicate the relevant context. For example, some exposures can affect the genes of children of the people originally exposed. So unless the experiment is multi-generational, we might still get the answer wrong. Lastly, we have criteria number nine, analogy. Assuming similar things might have a similar effect even with limited evidence. So in other words, we're being advised to make this assumption. So let's say we have sound experimental evidence that morphine has specific side effects. And then we get some early indications that another opiate, so a similar medicine, has some of these side effects. In such a case, we would reasonably be inclined to act on this weaker evidence because of our more detailed knowledge of morphine. Although this remains logical, well, these days we could probably do better. And the criteria remains logical, but this says we, we could probably do better, look at mechanism and have a deeper understanding, and, and, and we, we just have more tools at our disposal. For example, when it comes to strength of association or effect size, we now have specific statistical methods to test this. We also have more ways to research the pieces of the cause and effect puzzle. For example, while it may not always be feasible or ethical to conduct a randomized controlled trial, we may be able to use work in cell cultures, perfused organs, or animal models to piece together the mechanisms of cause and effect when they do in fact exist. More broadly, a lot more data about exposure to a vast number of things is now available to be used and estimated based on routine testing of environmental contaminants in the air we breathe and the food we eat and the water we drink than was available uh, at the time of these criteria were developed. And this means that there is sometimes more data to work with even before any formal research is conducted. And that brings us to data integration or uh, sometimes also called triangulation. There is simply more data out there from a broad range of research approaches or study designs that can be integrated to paint a clearer, more robust picture of causality when it exists. We also simply have a better understanding of genetics than we did back when Sir Hill published his criteria. For example, we know that some exposures can have an effect of one or more generations into the future, so multi-generational effects. We also now have the ability to model many things using computers, and we have better statistical analysis approaches. None of these invalidate the original criteria, but they do expand and refine 
how we might apply them. If you need further explanation or examples of what was covered, I recommend the following two papers, which uh, include the original. Again, if you found this useful, please hit like, um, please subscribe, and most importantly, keep watching and keep learning about research. It's important, it affects all of us, and we should at least have some basic understanding of how to interpret it, how to critique it, and know when to reject it or when to accept it.